Siblings and coworkers, parents and supervisors. We all have people in our lives with whom it can be hard to get along, and even a good relationship has its rough spots. Join us as we take a kingdom approach to relationships, Heart Smart, a practical guide to relating like Jesus. Good morning, Woodland Hills. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, you, you, we're mixing things up a lot of these days, aren't we? Uh, so I'm up here preaching after one song, uh, and that's just to keep from getting into a rut and a routine and, and also to encourage people to come on time and things like that. So sorry I couldn't be here in person last Sunday. I you know, was here by video, but uh, that having this, it's really just been a crazy fall. It's been so beautiful outside, and yet I've been feeling, last two and a half weeks just had this crud. I've never been sick for two and a half weeks straight. It's like, ah. So it's not like deathly sick, but I'm still doing the hand bump thing. So if we greet afterwards, just, you know, bump me in the hand and, and cover your mouth and I'll try not to cough all over you. But uh, so there you go. But at least I'm here. Praise God. All right. We are in this series uh, called Heart Smart. Wasn't Sue great last week? I, I just love her. She's got so much wisdom. She's a gift. She'll be coming back. Um, uh, in a, a couple of weeks, she'll be doing another me uh, message, and um, then we're going to have a panel discussion with her. Oh, and that reminds me, uh, be sending in your Dear Abby stories. Uh, at the end of the series, we're going to have a panel of folks up here, including Sue, and uh, we'll take different scenarios that you guys send in. So if you have, you know, those difficult people in your life, difficult relationships, trying circumstances, things that are driving you crazy, uh, send those in. You might want to not mention particular names and things like that. Uh, you can alter a few of the things to conceal your, your, your identity. Uh, we don't want to cause any you know, major blow-ups here, but we will be addressing those, so you can send those uh, stories in. So uh, this is Heart Smart, and today we're going to be talking about something that's incredibly foundational to relationships in general, and that is communication. Communication. Um, and so we're entitling this message, She Said, He Heard. It could be He Said, She Heard. You, you get the kind of gist of, of where this is going. You can say, tell about something about how important communication is uh, to God by virtue of the fact of how often it's talked about in the Bible. Tons and tons of passages giving advice and principles and teachings about communication, about talking, and especially about listening. So we find verses like this in Proverbs. It says that the power of, in the tongue has the, is the power of life and death. Think about that. And those who love to talk will have to eat their own words. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? But see, what comes out of your mouth has the power to breathe life into relationships and healing and wholeness, or it also has the power to kill. So what comes out of your mouth becomes very, very important to relationships. And then you find this, this kind of a view that uh, if you love to talk too much, it's going to come back on you. And throughout the Bible, we find this emphasis on uh, listening being a much higher priority than talking. It's reflected in James. And I'll come back to this passage a little later on in this message. But he says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Write this one down. And by the way, I encourage you to be taking notes on this thing because there's going to be a lot of particular practical teaching about this that you might not automatically recall. He says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Always be more ready to listen than you are to speak. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, just this kingdom moment and for every person in this auditorium and for every person who will be listening this weekend through podcasts or any other means, and I bless them. I pray, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, you, you take this communication this morning and uh, infuse it with your authority and your clarity. We bind any kind of spirit that would be, uh, uh, have an agenda of bringing confusion or distortion or, or, or anything of the sort. And I ask that your word goes forth clearly and boldly and builds the kingdom in us, build your character in us, and build, Lord, us the skill of learning how to listen and speaking and relating in ways that glorify you. Build that in us and heal relationships through this message, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name and all of kingdom people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Okay, I'll come back to James here in a little bit, but I first want to lay a foundation uh, for it by saying this. The word communication comes from the Latin word communicare. And that word means to have something in common or to share something. That's what communication is. Uh, you're taking something that's in here and you're sharing it with another. You're making it a common. 
with one or more people. An idea, a feeling, experience, whatever it is you're sharing. So it's the act of bringing something, conveying meaning, having it shared. Now, what's interesting is that that is the same, really the same definition of a relationship, isn't it? You're relating to another person when you, something about your life is intersecting with their life. You're taking something that is, would otherwise be private, and you're making it common. You're sharing it with one or more people, depending on the kind of relationship it is. But that's what a relationship is. So really, relationship and communication are two sides of the same coin. Uh, if we're relating, we're communicating. If we're communicating, we're relating. And so this makes this message absolutely foundational. The thing is, is that, I mean, th th this is something that is absolutely crucial to God because God is relationship, right? God has followed us on the Holy Spirit, is a perfect, loving, harmonious relationship. And God creates this world to glorify, to, to, to put on display, and to participate in that beautiful, harmonious, loving relationship. Which means that all of our communication and all of our relationships should, uh, the goal is to have them reflect something of the harmony and the beauty and the love of the triune God. But let's be honest, not all of our communications do reflect the harmony and beauty and love of the triune God. Some of our conversations and relationships, uh, maybe sometimes they get kind of ugly. So this is an important thing for us to talk about. The thing is, Communication, the reason our communications don't consistently reflect the love and the harmony and beauty of the triune God is because communication is difficult. And relationships are difficult. I'm saying the same thing two different ways. Uh, we tend to think that communication is pretty straightforward. One person talks, another person's listening. Well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? I'm talking, you're listening. There we go. No problem. But see, communicare is making a meaning common, sharing a meaning. Uh, and that's beyond just talking and hearing. It involves communication and listening. You can have people who do a lot of talking, a lot of listening, or a lot of hearing, but there's no communication going on at all, right? You, you've had that happen. Uh, it's because the process of communication is more difficult than just someone opening their mouth and another person having ears. Uh, it goes way, way beyond that. So speaking of ADHD, uh, who here likes country western music? Any country western fans? Come on, if you're really country western fans, you should be going, ooh, hey, or something like that, right? Okay, there. Okay, so, we forgive you, okay? That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I, I offended one person less. I, I, I'm just joking, okay? Uh, it's not my cup of tea. Uh, you know, I go out of my way to try to be broad in my appreciation of music, and, and I, I like all sorts of different kinds of music, but especially speed metal, as you know. Uh, but... Uh, the three that I have the hardest time getting in on are, number one, polka. <laughs> Roll out the barrel. Uh, and then, then I, what I don't even want to try to get into is that really raunchy hip-hop stuff that comes by my window a couple times a day. Um, and the car, boom, the windows shake because the bass is so loud. And then the third one is country. I, I try, I really try. I listen to Shania Twain and, and all of that. And, uh, um, I, I, it, I just have trouble. Okay, I struggle with it. But I have to admit this. Uh, sometimes the country songs have a good message in them. They do. It's sad that it's wasted on such a sorry genre, but they do have a good message. <laughs> Just kidding. Forgive me, forgive me. They'd be much better in speed metal. Take that message for it. It'd be much better. I think a lot of you feel about speed metal the way I feel about country. But anyways, so but here's the thing. All that is to say this. Uh, today, I'm going to be stretched, and some of you will be stretched, and some of you are just going to be in heaven because we're going to play part of a country western song. Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's t entitled, She Said, He Heard. And uh, it's kind of, kind of pretty. It's by Susie Bogus. I called her Bogus last service, and said, someone said, yeah, it's, that's your view of country western music. That's not her name. So it's Susie Bogus. She Said, He Heard. Let's listen to this. However they do that thing. I, all right. You know, I, okay, that's the fourth, fifth time I've heard that, and I have to admit, it's kind of growing on me. It's got a nice chord progression there. It's kind of tender. All right, all right. So something good's coming out of this. Well, anyways, can you relate to that song? Any married person who says no, you're lying. <laughs> if you're married more, for, more than four minutes, you know how that goes down. It happens all the time. The guy says, honey, you know, do we have any batteries? He's looking through the drawers. I need some AA batteries. And what she hears is, oh, it's your job to keep the house stocked to meet my every need. All right? Or they're driving home, and she's, he says, uh, honey, it was so nice to spend the day with your mother. And what she hears is, you owe me big time. 
because that's probably what the guy meant. And that's probably true. She says, do you think I look fat in this dress? And what he hears is, do you ever want to have sex with me again? That's... <laughs> well, the one I like the best is Dumb and Dumber, where the gal says, the chances of a girl like me getting together with a guy like you are about one in a million. And he says, what he hears is, oh, you're saying there is a chance. All right, I, I got you. <laughs> there is a chance. There's a big gulf between what is said and what is heard, right? It, it, Communication is not simple. It's not just a matter of talking and hearing. It, it's a complex process, and there's a lot that can go wrong in between. Sometimes, you ever find this happening, where you, you think you're having a conversation, and it turns out you're talking about two entirely different things. Uh, you know, it's just bizarre. You can go on for a couple minutes having a conversation, and it turns out, t- uh, this happens in our house with some frequency. The other week, um, we were talking about this person in our life that's kind of difficult that we have to deal with, and um, uh, they are overconfident in what they think they know, and they always have to have it their way, and they're kind of irresponsible about things, and they're causing some marriage problems that they're involved in, and we're kind of wondering what is our role in this. So we're talking about this important issue. At some point, Shelly changed the topic without telling me. (laughs) Or maybe she told me, but I didn't pick up on it. Or maybe she just thought she told me, because this happens sometimes, uh, what she thinks and what she says kind of gets confused, and she thinks she says it, but she didn't really. I don't know. But we're talking about this difficult, difficult person, and all of a sudden she says she's so dedicated to her family, and it's just so selfless, and she has to straddle so much between work and job and the kids and, and, and everything, and my heart just goes out to her, and I'm, I'm thinking, What? What? No, no, the problem here is that she's not responsible, and, and she lays too much on the husband, which is why he's getting resentful. Uh, you know, she just doesn't carry the load there. And Charlie goes, how can you say such a thing? Uh, you know, uh, th- that is really, I can't believe you would say such a thing. And I said, well, you yourself admit that she was irresponsible. I think maybe we're supposed to sit down with them and try to help them work through this thing. And she goes, sit down with them like a marriage counselor. They got the healthiest marriage I've ever, I've, we've ever seen. Uh, it's, just, it, it's just incredible. And I'm thinking, what planet are we on? How can you, you know, at, at what point she goes, I can't. This went on for like 25 seconds or something. And th- it was the most confusing 25 seconds in my life. And then finally she goes, I can't believe you'd even think such things about our daughter. <laughs> I'm like, daughter? Who is talking about daughter? We're talking about so-and-so. She goes, no, if you were listening, I told you that we, we're good ch- I wanted to talk about, you know, uh, our daughter. I said, honey, I think you thought that, but you didn't say that. Anyways, it ended up being a good laugh. But you could, you, we're having this conversation, but it's not a conversation. The gap between what is said and what is heard can sometimes be quite enormous. Communication in this fallen world is quite difficult. We we think it's a simple thing of talking and hearing, but in fact, there's a lot more going on, and it's challenging, and yet it's so important. It's been estimated that we spend about 80% of our waking time communicating in some way, receiving and giving information, either talking with people or listening to radio, television, or internet, or writing or reading or whatever. 80% of our life is done doing this. And yet, there's one research that found that about 75% of the time, we're not paying full attention to what we're doing, which is fine when you're watching television or something. But uh, we condition ourselves to not really be paying attention when we communicate. And sometimes that can be, you might just miss a cue that your wife gave you that the topic has changed if we're not used to paying full attention. In fact, this one group of researchers determined that the average American has an, uh, the adult American has an attention span of 22 seconds, which is probably optimistic in, for some of us. Uh, it's probably exaggeration. And can you believe the Royals actually lost the World Series? I was so rooting for them. They're such underdogs, but yeah, that's how it goes. Can you believe it? That means if you want to be heard, you have to keep your message to 21 seconds or less. <laughs> how am I supposed to preach in 21 seconds? See, I probably lost you and got you back 18 times by now. It's just, okay, so we're, we're, we're swimming in an uphill thing here. Communication is difficult with attention spans like that, but that's how it goes. And the reason why, here's, here's why it's so difficult. We've got to rely on words, and we've got to rely on gestures and tones and expressions, right? But those things can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways. They're, they're inherently ambiguous. And the reason they're ambiguous is because we all have filters that interpret things, and the filters are different. We all have, you know, sort of maps of the territory. There are mental map about what is going on here, and our mental map about what words mean, 
and, and they're all kind of different. We all bend and delete and emphasize some things and ignore certain other things depending on our filter. And our filter it comes at us from, it arises from our experiences in the past, our upbringing, our education, our personality types, the way we process information. All of that goes into our grid through which we interpret the world, and they're all very, very different. And so words and expressions and gestures and tones can mean very different things to different people. Um, if I say the word police right now, police, probably for most folks, that is a good word. That's, that word means safety and protection and law and order and, and, and rescuing kittens from trees and things like that. Uh, but I bet there are some folks for whom that word is not so positive. Maybe it makes your heart start to beat a little faster and it has a menacing quality to it. If you feel kind of threatened by that, because it may be that your experiences have not been uniformly positive about policemen. Um, this is why events like what happened in Ferguson, it reveals how whites and blacks can live in very different worlds, statistically, and part of that is the different experiences they have with policemen. And in one group, it's almost uniformly positive, but in others, it can be, at times, quite negative. If you had a friend who got shot because he was reaching to get his license to show the policeman and the police officer assumed that he was reaching for a gun, well, that would make you a little less positive towards the police force. And so we have very different, we can't have different maps about things. Or if I say the word Congress or Senate, uh, it used to be that those words tend to be more positive, but now it would be probably almost uniformly negative. Uh, you know, the meanings change, the maps change on things. I, I saw one poll that had a 6% rating of Congress, approval rating, and you wonder about those six. But anyways, <laughs> the thing is, so, so we all have these different maps. Now, the problem arises when we assume that our map is the territory, and as fallen creatures, we tend to do that. The way that we interpret the world, the meaning that we give to words, we just, our default is to assume that that's just the way it is. That we, we have objective access to reality. Maybe other people have to go through goods, but our perception is the right perception. We know the real meaning of things. And see, as long as we have that attitude, our map is the territory, we have an accurate perception in all things, uh, as long as we have that, then if another person disagrees with us, if they have a different map, well, they're just wrong. They're just wrong. And maybe they're wrong, you know, unintentionally, in which case they're just maybe stupid, or they're wrong intentionally, in which case they're deceptive. And so when someone just has a very different way of looking at things, it's easy for us to start to say, they say they care, but they really don't care, because if they really did care, they'd agree with our program for helping the poor and doing these things. Oh, they say this, but they really mean this. They're deceptive, or they're just dumb. And then this is what gives birth to the us-them polarities that characterize our culture and characterize in different ways the world. People get locked into their maps, and we like to hang out with people who have similar maps to us because that makes us feel even more right. So people start self-selecting into different groups. We quarantine each other <laughs> from, from each other, to use a contemporary example uh, as an analogy, and, and we get siloed, and in time we, we lose the capacity to ever kind of talk with each other. Because communication is about a shared meaning, shared meaning, making something common, which means their map and your map overlap to the degree that you're really communicating. You get on the inside of someone else's map. You get their meaning. But see, for that to happen, it requires us to be willing to suspend our map, to put it on, on hiatus, put it aside, in order to try to get in on that map, even though maybe it's very foreign to us. Maybe it's even distasteful to us, but communication only happens to the degree that we access another person's map, which means we can't absolutize our own map. It's impossible to communicate with anyone with a different map as long as you're holding onto your map as the absolute map, the territory. The communication process looks something like this, and the similarities between me and Shelley in this uh, cartoon are totally coincidental. <laughs> so here's Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> she's refuted what I just said. Uh, she's got thoughts. She wants to share ideas, concerns, feelings, experiences, uh, relationships. She wants what's on the inside of her to now be shared with me. Now, she has to encode that. I bet if we weren't fallen, we wouldn't have to rely on these kind of things so much, but we are fallen. So she has to use words and tone and body language and gestures and facial expressions to convey what's on her heart and mind. Now, my job then is try to discern the meaning of this encoding, to decode it. It's not self-evident. Um, 
And so I have to listen, I have to observe, I have to inquire, clarify, confirm that what I'm thinking is what she's actually saying. And that will either result in understanding where I actually get it on the inside of her map, or it can result in misunderstanding if I don't. If I assume that I know the meaning of her message, or if I just impose my own meaning on them, uh, well then it, it, there won't be any communication. And that is what starts this us-them thing, and our maps are not overlapping, and communication isn't, isn't happening. That begins to build up resentment in the people, which makes them even less inclined to uh, put aside their map, to get on the other person's map. And this starts a downward spiral of increasing hostility in marriages if you're not careful. So that's, that's sort of the model here. We've got to be willing to suspend our map to get on the inside of another person's map if communication is going to occur. Now, the Bible has quite a bit to tell us about how to do that, all right? Some good instructions on this. And so this is what I'm going to turn to. I want to come back to this James passage and kind of pick it apart. So James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. This is an absolute crucial thing for communication to occur. For, to get on the inside of another person's map, their meaning, their heart, what's on, what's on their mind, we've got to be slow to speak but quick to listen. And so I'm going to break that into two parts. The first part is the quick to listen part, the most important part. Someone, some have said that you know, the fact that we've got two eyes that take in information and two ears that take in information, but only one mouth to give information, must mean that God wants us to be four times more willing uh, to listen than we are to speak. I don't know if that's true or not uh, about the mouth and ear thing, because we've only got one nose. Does that mean that smelling is a low priority to God? I don't know. But uh, who cares? It is the case, we see in Scripture, that listening always has the priority over speaking. Listening is absolutely crucial. You find tons of verses on this. The trouble is, is that we're not usually taught how to listen. It's just sort of assumed that we know what listening is, which is why we tend to assume it's the same as hearing. Oh, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear the words. That doesn't mean that you're listening to what's being said. Uh, Steve Covey, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, says this, communication is the most important skill in life. We spend most of our waking hours communicating, 80% approximately. But consider this. You spend years learning how to read and write, years learning how to speak. But what about listening? What training or education have you had that enables you to listen so that you really deeply understand another human being from the individual's own frame of reference? That is, that, that is rather bizarre if you think about it. Now, if you've been to graduate school in psychology, you've probably learned some skills on listening, but the rest of us haven't. It's just assumed that we know how to do that. And it's not hard to do when there's a person whose map is, is very close to, to your own, but when you're dealing with people who have a very different kind of a map, and especially if you're dealing with tense situations, with arguments, with conflict, now it requires great skill to get outside, in, on the inside of their, lap, their, their, their map. Uh, listening is, is, is not something that just comes automatic. It's, it's, it's work and requires humility because you've got to humbly submit yourself to their map, which means you set aside your map. It is an act of love, and everything we do is to be done in love, right? Uh, it, it's love because you are saying to this person, you are worth listening to. You are worth the work it's going to take for me to get on the inside of your head and your heart. You're ascribing worth to another when you are attending to them and you're doing the work that's necessary to get on the inside of their map. Uh, Douglas Steer is this Quaker author who said this. I think it's a, a profound statement. To listen to another soul, which is just is way different than hearing their words, folks. To listen to another soul may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. You dignify them by your willingness to submit and to hear and to learn from them. So uh, let me give a few principles about listening from Scripture. One is this. It's always important to withhold your response until you're sure that you've heard what was said. This is something that's stressed over and over and over again in the Bible. Don't respond until you are sure what you're responding to. Uh, Proverbs 18 has a few verses on this. He says, A fool does not find joy in understanding. He's referring to understanding another person. But only in expressing his own opinion. Those are irritating to be around. They love to hear themselves talk, but they're not really interested in what you have to say. Uh, verse 13 says, Whoever gives an answer before he listens is stupid and shameful. <laughs> when you just think you know what they're going to say, so you just interrupt them and give your answer. It's, it's stupid and shameful. And verse 15, The mind of a person who has understanding acquires knowledge from the other person, but the ears, and the ears of wise people seek knowledge. 
The ears of the wise seek to know what the other person is saying. That's wise. But the fool finds no joy in understanding the other, has no delight in that. They only want to hear themselves talk. And the foolish person gives an answer before they actually have heard what the other person is saying. It can especially happen when, when you expect to hear something from another person, when you think you know what they're going to say. And this is what happens in marriages where you get into patterns. As soon as they start talking on a topic, your brain goes, blah, 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 blah. I've heard this all before. And then what can happen? Does this ever happen to you? Where the, if, especially if it's a difficult topic, a disagreement, and especially if it's a topic like you, there's a critique of you going on. That as the person's talking, you're formulating your response in your head. Oh, I'm going to say this. Oh, I can't wait. To, oh, oh, I got a checkmate going on here. I can't wait. Oh, this is going to be good. Huh? I know what I'm going to say. Oh, yeah, she thinks oh, I'm going to say this. And so what's happening is you're not, you're not listening to their words. You're simply using their words as ammo. You're preparing, you know, you're loading your gun with their words. But that means you're not doing the work to try to get on inside of what's really behind the words. What, what are they actually saying? Their, their, their conversation is being filtered by your own conversation. You're already talking. It's just that you may not verbalizing it, but in your head you're talking. So their, their conversation is getting filtered through your conversation, which means... You're imposing your map on their map, and therefore you're not hearing their map. And scripture tells us, no, it, 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 always wait before you give a response. Know what the other person is, is saying. Um, communication is about a shared meaning, and, and for that to happen, uh, you've got to stop the internal chatter, stop the external t- chatter. Basically, shut up and listen, <laughs> and, and really listen. Um, he, here's a biblical principle that I encourage you to memorize. It's just so simple, but so... So profound. It's listen in order to understand, not to reply. Don't be listening to give a clever reply because that's not listening. Listen to understand the other person. You're ascribing worth to them when you're listening to understand the other person, to get on the inside of the other person. Uh, But if you're only listening to reply, you're detracting worth from them because you're saying they're not worth really listening to. And that's not loving. So listen to understand, not to reply. A second thing is this. Be an active listener as opposed to a passive listener. A passive listener is just a receptacle. Uh, you just hear the words. And that's what we tend to do, because we think we forget that our map's not the territory, so we think words are self-evident, and so we just hear the words. But really, good, at, good listening, skillful listening, wise listening, loving listening, biblical listening, is at least as much work as talking. In fact, it's probably more work. It's active. Um, and, and, and so there's things you do to make sure that you're hearing what the other person is saying. Here's a few, uh, here's a few tips. Give the speaker cues that you're engaged. This helps you stay engaged, but also lets them know that you're, you're, you're tracking with them. You know, eye contact, nodding your head, saying, uh-huh, okay, gotcha on that. Okay, I'm following you. Just stay engaged with them. Second, listen beyond words to the deeper heart and meaning of what's being said. This is the act of empathizing. Empathize with the person. To empathize means that you, you, you walk in their shoes. You, you, you step into their eyes, if it were. Try to see the world. Genuinely try to, to enter into their experience. See the world from their perspective. Which is going to be challenging if you don't like their perspective. You, you, you want to re- refute their perspective. But you don't even know what you're refuting until you step on the inside of it. Um, you'll know that you have understood them when... You can see how a person, with, from their perspective, with their story, with their set of assumptions, with their beliefs, how they would see the situation the way they see it. It makes sense from the inside of their world. Now you've, you've understood them. It makes sense. It doesn't mean that you agree with that. You have different assumptions, different beliefs perhaps, but you understand how they could, from their perspective, see the situation the way they see it. Given all the things about them, you can see why they would see you as a jerk. Uh, you, you understand that. And if you were them, you'd see them that way as well. Now, maybe you have a good response to that, but don't give it until you first know that you understand why they see you as a jerk or whatever the issue happens to be. Empathize. Get on the inside. That validates the person. It validates their perspective. It doesn't mean that it's, their map also is a territory, so their map may be off in some ways, but you at least firm the, the rationality of that, that map. Now, that's really, that's really t- tough. If the conversation is about you, if it's a critical conversation about you, it's really, it takes great maturity to still be able to empathize and to enter into it. Because as fallen beings, when we're being criticized, we have a tendency to want to be our own defense lawyer, don't we? Uh, we don't like that. 
Um, and, and, and so we start to like, put up protective things. We want to quickly respond. We start formulating our, our, our defense case. And now we're turning their words into simply ammunition that we want to use against them because we want to refute them. We're not the jerk that they say we are. I encourage you, in, in, and that's your amygdala here, right, that, that Sue talked about last week. Our, our stupid amygdala can't tell the difference between a physical attack and a social attack, so it responds the same way. And so we start to get, get our heart racing and or, you know, our, it starts sweating, and we just want to get big and pound our chest and scream at them and hit them and run away or something. Uh, it's not helpful. I encourage you, if you're entering into a conversation that you know is going to be tough for you to hear, Remind yourself, you get your life from Christ, your worth, your significance, your security, your lovability. It's all found in Christ. What God thinks about you on the cross will not change. So you don't need to have a defense attorney or to be your own defense attorney. Uh, what, if they're, what if they're right? Maybe you really are a jerk. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, as, as a follower of Jesus, you, you would want to learn about that. Um, but you don't, it doesn't affect your, your, your core sense of worth and significance. We only defend our, course, our worth and significance in a social setting when we're getting some life from it. We need it. We want people to think good about us. So if this person's going to make us look a little poor, well, then we've got to beat our chest and get big. So remind yourself that your life and worth and significance and security and lovability is found in Christ. And that frees you now to be able to enter into the world of another, even if it's critical of you. And, and to learn from it and, and to be curious about it and to find out why they see you this way. And maybe you'll find that, in fact, there are parts of you that, you know, come across as being a jerk. Or you might find that there's some woundedness in them that caused them to see you that way, whatever. But it's challenging when you're under attack. It's also challenging when the person's map is radically, radically different from your own. Um, there are people whose map, I found, people whose map is so different from my own, uh, that they're just plain weird. I'm the normal one, they're the weird one. And so, you know, they should just deal with that. I see, it, it, I don't know if I'm the exception here, but sometimes it, people, it's like, what planet are you from? I, I don't, and unfortunately, uh, one of the folks that felt like they were from a different planet was my wife. Uh, it was weird because we were friends for three years and it, this alien stuff never came up. As soon as we got married, there's all this alien stuff. What's, what's with marriage that does that? I, you've married an alien. And there would be times where we'd be talking about an issue and honestly, she processes things so different from me. Her brain is wired so different from me. Her life experiences are so different from me that I, it was like she's speaking Chinese with some words drop or vowels missing or something. It's, you're speaking in tongues, honey. I, I, I don't have a clue what you're saying. I, don't, I, can't, I can't even begin to respond except to do this because I don't know what you're saying. Am I alone in this? Any, any <laughs> You, if you've been there, it's like, uh, there's a, I'm over here, and on the other side of the universe is you, and I don't know what to do, but no, here's the thing. I, I found that, that, I mean, part of it is that she processes things highly on the emotive end of things. I am highly on the cerebral end of things, and it is a lot of work to get on each other's maps. It takes a lot of work. It, it's like going from two plus two to higher level trigonometry. It's going from linear to nonlinear quantum physics. It's, it's, a, it's a, but you know what? I am here to testify in Jesus' name that it can be done. It can be done. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know what that does? It grows you as a person. It grows you. It expands you. I would never, I, I mean, that is a, is a slice of reality I would never know about unless I was married to that slice <laughs> and, and had to learn to, to love that slice. And we found that precise, the work of trying to get into each other's maps, that it actually makes you fall in love because you realize how hard they're trying. Uh, you know, it, 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 it really works. So folks, if you're married to an alien, hang in there, and you can learn that alien language, and you'll be a better person for it. There you go. Amen. All right. This is about suspending your own map to get into the map of another. That's, that, that's what listening is all about. Uh, ask questions. Ask clarifying questions. Make sure that you're tracking with them. What I'm hearing you saying is, and be curious. Like, what, what did it feel like when you experienced that? Because you're trying to empathize, get on the inside. Be quick to listen, but slow to speak. Let's talk about that now. Slow to speak. A lot of verses in the Bible address this topic. Proverbs 21 says, watch your words and hold your tongue. You'll save yourself a whole lot of grief, as some of us have learned. 
Watch your words. Be careful about it. Psalm 141, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. <laughs> Lord, will you help me to shut up? Please, God, put a guard here. Uh, sew my lips shut. Uh, watch over the door of my lips. What comes out of our mouth has the power of life and death, and therefore it's extremely important. Uh, to be slow to speak just means that you're deliberate, you're careful, you're watchful. You think before you speak. That's a nice little tip. Think about what you're going to say, because those words come out, and they can do a lot of good, and they can also do a lot of damage. So let me just give two basic principles about this. And they're just foundational. Uh, one is, the first is the most important, do everything in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, everything is to be done in love. Love always looks like the cross, and the cross ascribes worth to other people, right? At cost to ourselves if necessary. Do everything in love. And that means all of our conversations should be done in love, which means all of our conversations should be done in ways that ascribe worth to the other person. Uh, all of our conversations should reflect our conviction that this person was worth God Almighty dying for, so they could not possibly have more worth. Now, it, it may mean that in this conversation you need to fire them because you're the boss. It may mean that you need to confront some ugly stuff. It may mean that, you know, some real tough di discussions have to happen. This doesn't mean that we're all, everything's going to be rosy and flowery. But whatever else is said, the fact that this person has unsurpassable worth should always be the given. Maybe their job performance needs critiquing and things like that. Maybe their attitude needs adjusting. But all of that has to be done in ways that ascribe worth to the person, which means... And here's, the, here's the, the key principle. Never should our words, however, however, whatever we have to confront, never should our words detract from the worth of another person, degrade the worth of another person, undermine the, the dignity of the other person. Never should our words be used as weapons. All right? Uh, and in this fallen world, they often are used as weapons. But in, in the body of Christ, they're never to be used that way. Paul says this in Ephesians 4. He says, speak the truth in love. And he says, don't say anything that would hurt another person. That goes after their person. Now, maybe they'll be offended by because you had to talk about the job performance, but you, you don't intend to hurt them, to detract their worth. Instead, speak only what is good about them as a person so that you can give help wherever it is needed. If people feel valued by you, they'll, they'll be much more open to receiving whatever advice you give them. That way, what you say will help those who hear you. But if you wound them, they're not going to listen to you anyways. So speak the truth in love. The word truth there is aletheia. It means uncovered, uncovered, uh, authentic, honest, open. So when we speak, we're supposed to speak it straight, honestly. None of this Minnesota passive-aggressive stuff. <laughs> no, say it straight. Say it straight. But in saying it straight, you say it in love, and love always describes worth to the other. The package has got to be love. It can be a tough, straight word, but it's got to be packaged in ways that affirm the inherent worth of the other person. I've known people who have carved up people with their words, just sliced them to the ground. And they justify it by saying, hey, I was just speaking the truth. Someone had to speak the truth, and it was me. Well, see, if you speak that, maybe what you said was absolutely true. Yeah, the person really is a loser in all these categories. Yeah. Uh, but if you missed, if you didn't ascribe ultimate worth to them, unsurpassable worth to them, you missed the most important truth you're supposed to communicate. So you didn't speak the truth. The, you can speak all true things and still be untrue if you don't speak it in a way that affirms the unsurpassable worth of the other person. Uh, I, I, truth spoken without love is simply equivalent to untruth. And so everything we say should be done in love and never should our words be used as weapons. And what happens is that sometimes if the conversation is difficult, we start to get triggered that reptilian brainstem and that amygdala start to get activated and it sends chemical cocktails like Sue talked about last week into our system and our heart starts to beat and, 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 and we start to get big or start to get fearful and then our conversations get hijacked and nothing loving or positive is going to come out of that. Uh, man, I, there's a couple uh, last year uh, in the summertime, this happens in our neck of the woods once in a while where we have these street fights. And so this couple, I don't know if they're married or just dating or whatever, but they started to get into a fight, and it, it, it just escalated. It just started to escalate. Uh, and the words got harsher and harsher and nastier and nastier and vile and vile and viler and viler. More vile and more vile. More and more vile. Yeah, that's it. More and more vile. It was just, it went from G to PG to PG-13 to R to boom, X. You know, plug the kid, kid's ears, because these people were just killing each other with words. I, I actually went up on the top of my garage to look at what was going on because I was afraid that they were going to start fighting, which actually happened. The gal attacked the guy and whooped him, and he, he ran away. Um, 
But it was just so vile, and I thought, okay, this is just not productive. What is going on here that is at all helpful? This is no different than, than, than the two animals, you know, screaming at each other. It reminded me of this chimpanzee fight I saw at the Apple Valley Zoo, where they're just going, ah, ah, ah. Well, that's what they're doing, just screaming. There's no content there. They're wounding each other with, with words. The words are weapons. Never should that happen in the body of Christ. If you find yourself getting triggered, uh, then take, uh, stop. If, if you're getting triggered or another person's getting triggered, you stop and say, hey, wait a minute, time out, time out. We need a 20-minute break. Because Sue told us it takes 20 minutes to detox from those chemicals. And so take a 20-minute break. And when you take a 20-minute break, put on some music or, or read a book or do something that's not thinking about the fight. Because if you take a 20-minute break, but all you do is ruminate about how bad the other person is in the fight, you're just keeping the chemicals going. I uh, know, so you detox from that, and now when you come back, something positive, something good can actually, can actually happen. Proverbs 15 says that the, the, the soft answer turns away rash. Uh, 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 a harsh word turns away a rash. You can't get rid, rid of a rash with a soft answer. Use eczema cream or something. But if you want to get rid of a harsh word, uh, then use a soft answer. <laughs> Talk about communication problems. That's after 15, 12 years of speech therapy, too. I can't, you know, this is tough. So I know a little bit about miscommunications, let me tell you. Uh, the tongue of a wise uses knowledge rightly. That's speaking it in love, softly. But the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness because you just escalate the situation. When someone comes at you with a harsh word, respond softly and you diffuse it. But if you respond more harshly, well, now your amygdala is doing the talking and nothing good will come with that. Final thing I'll say, I just close with this, is remember that we are in a war zone, folks. And it can be the case that there's more going on in a, in a miscommunication than just the miscommunication. Paul says, our struggle is never against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and authorities uh, and uh, forces of evil in and, and, and the heavenly realms. There, there's a thief out there that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. It's all he does. He comes only to do that, Jesus says. And he would love to kill, steal, and destroy whatever good is in a relationship. Um, our battle is against them, never against flesh and blood. If it's flesh and blood, it's not your enemy. Uh, but see, the, the powers try to play us so that we think the other person is our enemy, so we're not identifying them as the enemy. It can happen. I, have you ever had this where you're in a conversation and all of a sub, sudden nobody understands anybody about anything? It's just a massive, it, it, the Tower of Babel happens. It's, you're all, it, it, there's just nothing but confusion. Sometimes you just can't dig your way out of that. So I encourage you to consider the possibility that there's something else going on here. In our marriages, in our church, in our office places, wherever, I found that if you can stop and join forces with the other person, reaffirm that they're not the enemy. Right now, maybe you don't like them very much, you're mad at them, whatever, but join forces in Jesus' name and take authority over anything in the spiritual realm that is polluting the environment, that's causing confusion. You bind it in Jesus' name, take authority over it, and man, there's a cleansing effect. It's like, it's like a diffuser with a nice aroma. All of a sudden, there's this clarity that can be there. In marriages, it's, it's really helpful, and it's hard to do if you're really mad at the person, but all the more reason to do it. And the act of coming together to identify a common enemy and, and reaffirm that you're not each other's enemy, well, that itself is a bridge that often heals. It's just what is needed in a time of conflict. So remember that there's also spiritual elements to this whole thing. As kingdom people, the way that we talk is not just about effective relationships, as important as that is, but it's a form of spiritual warfare. Amen? Okay, always keep that awareness on. All right, I'd like to ask the uh, worship team to come back. We're going to head into another time of worship. Uh, we'll start by taking up an offering. Um, that, is, that also is an act of, I mean, we ascribe worth to the kingdom and to our God by how much, what we sacrifice for that cause. Uh, the biblical economic plan is this. God says, give and it will be given unto you. Full measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Uh, God has this plan where he, he, the purpose for being blessed is to bless others. And, you know, how the blessing is through, the, through giving to the kingdom. And his promise is that the more we bless, all other things being equal, the more we bless, the more he'll give us to be blessed with and to bless others with. I encourage you to get in on that economic plan. It only happens when we start giving sacrificially to the point where we feel the pinch. We budget for it. We don't give, give to the kingdom like a tip, like, oh, I got an extra five or whatever. But you budget for it. And then you enter into God's economic plan. Pray about that and submit all your resources to him. So, Father, as we now go into this time of communicating with you, I pray, Lord, that you'll just infuse this time with your spirit and your power as you did the first two services. Uh, inhabit the praises of your people. Help us to focus totally on you. 
And teach us, Lord, uh, to steward all your resources in ways that reflect the supremacy of your value in our life as we submit our tongue, our ears, our life, our time, our wallet, our everything to you right here and right now. In Jesus' name, amen.